Tonight on the Donlin Report, a half a billion at-home tests. That's a big part of the president's plan to fight Omicron, but they won't be available for the holidays. Is it too little, too late? We'll also talk with an unvaccinated professor who fought against his employer's mandate and won. How does he feel when the president calls out the unvaccinated? And a small town in Mississippi cancels its Christmas parade because of a string of recent shootings. Population around 500. How does that happen? We'll ask the mayor. Great to have you with us. We are in our Chicago studios. The Donlin Report starts right now. Omicron is a gut punch to the nation at the worst possible time, and that is the pulse of America tonight. Just when we're all gathering with family and friends, indoors, maybe even at a nearby pub, just like old times, Omicron has unfortunately given, given many people something to think and also worry about. Here we go again. A lot of you have no doubt are going to be second guessing your plans or maybe that night at the bar. I know I certainly am. The president says what will help is more testing and more tests, even at home tests, a half a billion of them. In fact, that's what he's ordered. But reporters pointedly asked him why there aren't more tests now. Is it a failure that you don't have an adequate amount of tests for everyone to be able to get one if they need one right now? No, it's not. Mr. President, what's your message to Americans who are trying to get tested now and who are not able to get tested and who are wondering what took so long to ramp up testing? Come on, what took so long? A little testy, the president said. No one saw Omicron coming. Those tests, however, won't be ready until next month. And with how fast Omicron is spreading, the question is, is that too little too late? Remember Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving? That's when we first heard about Omicron. It was actually the new variant. Headlines were blowing up our phones. And when they did, the markets sold off. The president addressed the nation the following day. And then a few days later, he addressed this about testing. This winter, we're going to make free at home tests more available to Americans than ever before. The bottom line this winter, You'll be able to test for free in the comfort of your home and have some peace of mind. So that was a week after Thanksgiving, and he called for more testing this winter. Winter is here now, and so are the holidays, with millions traveling by air per day, and the testing isn't here just yet. At airports and testing sites alike, people are waiting in line for hours. So what happened? Here's what Dr. Brett Giroir, the testing czar under President Trump, told us on the broadcast. The problem is, and it's just a fact, it's not political, is between January and September, uh, the Biden administration let the industry crumble. They didn't buy tests, they didn't order tests, they didn't guarantee the manufacturer, they didn't develop. We should have been up to a half a billion tests or more per month, but they let it drop. And now they're trying to turn it around. This, though, we talked about has been an issue from the jump. Remember, the U.S. struggled with the original test to diagnose COVID. Our tests didn't work, and it put us months behind other countries that were testing tens of thousands of people a day. Remember that? President Trump, early on in the pandemic, said anyone who wanted a test could get one. Anybody right now and yesterday, anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the tests, and the tests are beautiful. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. That wasn't the case then, and it still doesn't seem to be the case now, at least not without a major inconvenience. And as we've said before, Americans are tired of COVID, the rules are around COVID, and now our apparent inability to get ahead of it. And that's where we start. Joining us now, Dr. Human Norchasm, immunologist, public health advocate, and frequent guest on the broadcast. Doctor, it's good to have you back. So half a billion new tests, not, until, not until next month, though. What do we do in the meantime about testing? Well, look, Joe, um, I think it's absolutely important to be able to um, control, do some source control. So the, the, the point of identifying people who are infected, and particularly those who are asymptomatically infected, is to be able to contain them and uh, prevent uh, any further spread. So it's a rational choice. Now, the, the problem is that the doubling time for this Omicron is somewhere between uh, three to four days. So, you know, boosting the number of uh, screening tests at this point, um, you know, is, is, may end up being a little bit too, uh, too little 
little too late. Now, the, the other concern that I have is that with Omicron being as uh, transmissible as it is, you know, you can literally get a test, um, you know, uh, at this moment and then go next door from your CVS or your testing center to get a cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts and pick up the Omicron. So, hmm. you know, I think that really uh, the, the reality is that we, we should be focused on, on testing, but, but really the test that we should be focusing on is the test for immunity because that really is the crux and the Achilles heel of this pandemic. And I, you know, I know that the president and the Biden administration are really in a tough spot because we have this Omicron that's really ravaging the nation and, and um, you know, is very transmissible. And whatever gain we may have in terms of, um, you know, reduced severity, we may be losing in terms of the absolute numbers of people getting infected. So it's absolutely critical to, to get this under control. But really the key is immunity. And the screening test that's critical is actually a screen for immunity. So instead of plugging in the, uh, the Defense Production Act into, you know, rapid tests and things like that, which I think are important and there's certainly a role for them, I think the president should really think about plugging uh, the Defense Production Act into these antibody tests, which are rapidly yeah. available at places like LabCorp and Quest. I know it's important to track this stuff, doctor, but I'm wondering at this point with so many people getting this, if they're sick and don't have time to get in line or don't want to get in line and possibly infect other people, should you just assume you have it and stay isolated? Well, I, look, I think these, uh, these uh, uh, testing centers themselves, and particularly because these tests are not available at home very readily yet, you know, these testing centers themselves could serve as super spreader events, frankly, right? I mean, I don't know if you've seen some of the videos, but, you know, people are literally on top of each other. So I, I'm not necessarily convinced that these testing centers are a great thing. And I, you know, I think that uh, folks should be careful. I mean, you know, we have to uh, mask and distance as, as necessary. Certainly, if you're symptomatic, it's, it's rational to stay home and, and get a test. Uh, but again, I mean, I think we really should be focused on immunity. There are a lot of folks out there who've been vaccinated, even boosted, and their antibody levels are qu quite low. So I think we need to be able to identify these people. And really, from the beginning, as you know, I've been saying right. that the, the Achilles seal of this pandemic is, is the immune level of immunity. Right. We have a very good handle on these tests, and we should be doing them much I more I get that, because you're, you're doing those tests as well, doctor. And what I still don't understand is, do you have a known level of antibody, and how that equates to what you would have as an antibody if you got the vaccine. Absolutely. This is not a very hard thing to figure out. In fact, I, you know, I'm willing to bet you that the companies already know what the numbers are. Look, for example, at the LabCorp, you know, there's a semi-quantitative total antibody test for spike. And I can tell you that if you've been vaccinated and fully boosted, if your number is over 1,000 units per ml, you are probably quite robustly immune. If, if a boosted person has, you know, over 2,500 units per ml, that's a very well boosted person. So, you know, if, if you have that information on a personal right. level, if you want to get it, you know, you should be able to get that. And I, I would Really but right now you have to pay for it, plug right? You, well, most insurance covers it, but you need a doctor's script. I think w what could be done is that the, the Defense Production Act could be plugged in to, to these commercial laboratories, and they could rapidly do these tests. The turnaround time is about 24 hours. It's a very, very simple test, and it really will tell you quantitatively what your right. level of immunity is. And I'm telling you that over 1,000 units per ml, and that semi-quant from LabCorp, means you're very robustly immune. It's, it's very simple. What I, you worries know, I, me about this, Doc, because you and I have talked about it, and I know where you're going. I understand completely, but I don't want to give people the false sense that if they've had it, they're clean and they're not going to get it again because science has told us that that's not necessarily the case, right? Look, uh, Joe, you're absolutely right. Uh, biology happens on a bell-shaped curve, right? One of the big mistakes that was made by th about this vaccine's messaging was that it's a binary. It clearly isn't. There, there's, there's no biologic, there's no drug, there's no therapy that's ever a binary, you know, uh, all or none. You know, uh, the vast majority of people who get vaccinated get very well immune. And, and I think you can confirm that with the numbers. And if you're immune, chances are you're not transmissible. Chances are you're, not, you're protected from at least severe disease. Uh, you may not get infected. But, you know, there are some people who, who clearly are getting infected, and, and this, is, this is something to be expected. I think the best thing we could do is to actually extract good information. I mean, look, we live in the most technologically sophisticated country in the world. We've put a rover on Mars. This idea that we, should, we could be actually assessing the level of antibodies and level of immunity is really not out of the world. And I think the Biden administration has really made a mistake by not focusing and putting enough resource into testing for immunity. Right. This is the gold standard. I, you know, I really don't understand it. Frankly. Yeah, I mean, because the test we have now is whether you have it or not. And, uh, and that's really all yeah, you get Yeah, and two out seconds of later, you, Joe. If you could have it again. And, yeah. Joe, and you know, Joe, two, two seconds later, after you get your rapid test at the testing center, like I said, you can go to the next door Dunkin' Donuts and pick up Omicron. It's very transmissible. <laughs> okay. Listen, so, Dr. Human Norchasm, immunologist and public health advocate, it's always good to see you. And thanks for your time, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.
Merry Christmas. Same to you. The president saying today the key is not just getting tested, but also getting vaccinated, especially as we gather for the holidays. To folks who are not vaccinated, you may think you're putting only yourself at risk. But it's your choice. Your choice is not just a choice about you. It affects other people. You're putting other people at risk. Your loved ones, your friends, neighbors, strangers you run into. And your choice can be the difference between life or death. But Professor Todd Zawicki of George Mason University is holding out, and the professor joins us now. So it's, it's spreading quickly, Professor. Uh, you're a smart person. Are you listening or hearing any of this, or are you still in the same camp? Oh, I'm listening and I'm hearing all of it. And I, uh, everything that I've learned since I last saw you this summer, Joe, has uh, persuaded me that I've made the right decision, uh, which is when we last spoke back this summer, uh, as you recall, I had very robust immunities, just as uh, Dr. Norchasm was talking about. I said I would revisit the issue in about six months. Um, I did an antibodies test last week. And after a fall of traveling, attending conferences, Virtually every conference I attended this fall, some vaccinated person got COVID. Um, my antibodies level has actually gone up, which is not unusual for uh, somebody with natural immunity. I did a T cell test uh, through T, uh, T detect. My T cells uh, I tested positive for. Um, I have very robust immunity. And what we've learned again and again and again and again, Joe, is uh, there was just a recent study from the Netherlands, uh, which is that the vaccines do not perform as well against the variants as they do against their original variant, which is alpha. There was a study just earlier this month from the Netherlands that found that with respect to the beta, gamma, and delta variants, uh, which you just had on the screen, there is no overall decline um, in the protection of natural immunity against those three variants. Um, while there was an, uh, a marked decline in the protection provided by the uh, by the vaccines. Right. I follow very closely. I follow my immune level, and I'm convinced that I've made the right decision. I, I respect that, and a lot of people I think don't have access or either the I don't know how to, to all of the antibody testing that you do get. But I, I will believe you, especially when you know your level. But the CDC says those who've had COVID, like you, and are not vaccinated, are twice as likely to get it again compared to those who got the shot, and furthermore, five times more likely than fully vaccinated people who haven't gotten the vaccine or hadn't had the, the virus. Yeah, what we have in this country right now, Joe, is an epidemic of dishonesty from the CDC. Um, there are over 130 studies uh, that Paul Alexander has collected on the website of the Brownstone Institute. There's only two studies from the entire world two studies in the entire world that come out with those sorts of numbers. And those are the two studies from the CDC. I would refer all your listeners to Dr. Norchasm was just on, did a, uh, a, a meta-analysis with himself, um, uh, Dr. Mahesh Shanai and another doctor, where they looked at all of the evidence on this and they found a negligible, if any benefit, that's short-term from vaccinating somebody who's had uh, prior immunity. The second thing we know, Joe, is that there are now, I think, seven studies that show highly elevated risk of side effects for people who have natural immunity from getting vaccinated and highly elevated risk of severe side effects. One study actually found 6.8% of people who have natural immunity get vaccinated, end up in the emergency room or the hospital. Um, And so we're talking about dozens of possible people being harmed simply to prevent one if, uh, um, often asymptomatic uh, um, infection. If your antibody levels drop to a certain point, would you then consider getting the vaccination? Joe, I've always considered getting the vaccination. Now, that's why I followed this so closely. If I saw any evidence, for example, the vaccination would help me protect me from some serious uh, ailment from uh, from Omicron or the from like. From death. But I, I mean, that's what yeah, it is. Or death. It yes, yeah. exactly. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm monitoring this. I've had COVID, Joe. Yeah. I have had COVID. I don't want to get COVID again. I don't either. That's uh, people why I got tell the shot. Me, don't get COVID. I, you don't need to tell me to get, not to get COVID. <laughs> I've followed this closely. I've also followed uh, all the information that has come out. Uh, there are two studies that came out just this past month that find that the uh, the immune level of somebody per, for protection from the, Uni- the United Kingdom found 15 months after recovery is equivalent to three months after vaccination. Israel found one that was more than 12 months. All of this takes a test, though, right, right Professor? Vaccine. You need to get your antibody test in order to do this effectively as you have and rely on it because the CDC says Absolutely. the most protection, even if you've had it, is to get the vaccination. 
I would encourage everybody to ask your doctor and pester your doctor if you need to, to get an antibodies test, whether you're vaccinated, unvaccinated, partially vaccinated. It is time, as Dr. Norchasm was just saying, for us to focus on immunity and not this one size fits all medicine that has caused a lot of harm to people um, and is continuing to cause harm to people and a waste of resources. Professor Todd Zawicki of George Mason University, it's good to see you again. Stay safe. Uh, I, I don't want you to die, so <laughs> I know you're keeping a close eye on it. We want you on well, the show. Thank you, Joe, and you stay safe, too. All right, appreciate the time. So what does all this mean for our daily lives? Will testing and vaccines make a difference, or it's beginning to look a lot like a lockdown Christmas, perhaps? Another friend of the show, Tracy Burns, joins us now. Her day job, of course, financial advisor with UBS. She's also sort of our, our mom voice of reason here, Tracy, and that's what we're going to lean on tonight. <laughs> I know a lot of churches are canceling indoor services uh, over the holidays. Sports leagues are calling off games. Most people have travel plans that I'm sure they're rethinking. Is there still lasagna on for you this Christmas? So far, so far, but I'll be the first to admit that we are probably going to test the kids for sure because they all came home from school and they do what they do, which is why it's really hard to believe we didn't foresee this coming. We should have known when they all went bar hop in the night before Thanksgiving, like every college kid does when they come home, that we were going to start to see this again. So it's a little disheartening when you walk through local pharmacies like I did, looking for rapid tests and you can't find them anywhere. So I will right. test, um, but right now, no, I'm not canceling. But I'm not, I would not be surprised if people change their plans because at, based on your last two guests, Joe, the information that we're getting is so conflicting, no one actually knows what to do. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the one test you can get, but even then it's hard to get right now. How are you going to get these tests for the kids? They're going to get up at the crack of dawn and get online and put a parka on and get a cup of coffee and stand there wow. because I don't know what else to do. And we can't risk, I can't, we can't be the people that risk someone older getting it. Granted, my family is all vaxxed. I'm sure a lot of families are all mm -hmm. vaxxed too. But you just have to take extra precaution because no one wants to cancel. I don't want, I want that piece of lasagna this year, Joe. Yeah. I just worry and wonder how many people are going to do that get up early and get in line and stand online for hours and hours. If they're asymptomatic, I, I don't know. I just worry about what's going to happen in January, as I know the CDC is as well. Tracy, it just feels a little bit like we're going backwards. I mean, this is almost like where we were last year. Remember asking if we should even get together, although it's hard to argue we're better off in many respects this year, including the vaccine. And it sounds like if you're vaxxed, go ahead and get together. For sure. And I will say that what we've seen, if, if we can extrapolate results from South Africa, from India, this thing came in and left as, you know, quickly. So if we can figure this out and get through the next 20, 25 days, I think we might be on the other side of it. But at the same time, if we don't have testing and we don't have it readily available for people, then mm -hmm. who knows where it could end up? You know, SantaCon here in Manhattan uh, was supposed to be a really, really fun event. It turned out to be a super right. spreader. And so, sadly, I think that if you're going to try to keep us together and try to keep us safe for the next 20, 25 days, you may hear more and more of these events being canceled. By the way, last thing the economy needs, right? right. Last thing restaurants need is someone to cancel the holiday party. Well, I mean, that's what I was going to ask you about next, Tracy, because I know a number of cities are starting to go back to mandates. Uh, Atlanta, I think, is going back to the mask mandate indoors. Chicago added one today that you're going to have to have a vaccination card if you want to get into restaurants or other uh, indoor events. But that's not starting until January 3rd. So I guess my question is, do you foresee more issues for restaurants and indoor businesses who might have to either shut down or alter the way they're doing business? Absolutely. And, and I'm nervous for them. You know, they're, they're finally getting back on their feet. They're finally right. filling up tables again. They're finally trying to hire people again. And this is not going to hurt. Not only is this going to hurt their bottom line, this is going to hurt the hiring process all the more. People who are hesitant to go work at restaurants and be in pro close proximity to people are going to have that renewed nervousness again. Try getting an Uber driver, you know, or a Lyft driver these days. Nobody wants to do that either. That's too close proximity. So that's the kind of stuff that has long-term ramifications on the economy. Yeah. Listen, Tracy, um, on a personal note, you've been a big part of our show this year as we launched back in March. And I appreciate all the time and wish you all the best in the new year. And hopefully we'll see you soon. You sure will, Joe. It's been my pleasure. All right. Enjoy the lasagna. We'll see you.
The governor of California doing something about all those smash and grab robberies, pledging hundreds of millions of dollars to refund the police. That's a 180 for that state. Why the turnaround? First, though, how does a town of some 500 people have such a crime problem that it had to cancel its Christmas parade? We'll talk to the mayor next. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Neighbors in a small Mississippi town of around 500 people are having to go without their annual Christmas parade this year. The mayor of Crawford, Mississippi, decided to cancel the annual event because of a surge in shootings across the area in recent months. Mayor Willie Parson told a local news outlet that at any given moment in the town, you could hear 30 to 40 rounds being fired. Called it a war. So far, a number of homes and vehicles have been shot into, but no one's been hurt. Mayor Parson says she wants to keep it that way. Crawford, Mississippi Mayor Willie Parson joins us right now. Mayor, it's great to have you. I wish this were under happier circumstances. I'm just curious, what in the world is going on? You have 500 residents. Do you know? No, I really don't. Uh, I'd be glad it's almost over. Uh, hopefully, it's, it's over. We haven't had any shooting lately so since before the. Of a town of, of five or 600 people, I, f I feel like everyone probably knows everyone, right? Yes. So no well, one knows what's going on? No. You know, things happen at nighttime. You don't know eyes. Doctors don't have eyes, so can nobody see what's going on. Okay. Most people's in the bed. <laughs> Do you know anything about what's happening with these shootings? I mean, we said that it sounds like cars and homes are being shot into. Are, are these, do you think just, are they targeted? Are they random? What's behind them? Well, I really don't know. Uh, I don't think it was an area in our town that was uh, the shooting was at. Uh, the same area both times of uh, the area uh, was most of the shooting was at. So the houses, it was in between the houses that got shot and another street over from there that uh, a young man that got shot. Oh, so somebody did get hit. He got hit, but it was a lack of pellet gun. Um, oh. The weekend, that's Friday. So I looked it up to see if you had your own police department, and it doesn't appear you do, correct? So who's uh, who's patrolling the, uh, the the town? Lowndes County Sheriff. And how many deputies do they have to, to handle this? Uh, I really don't know. Not enough, apparently, they, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not enough. So well, they're working on it. Okay. I got to give them that. They've been working on it. All right. And so they have been patrolling the area. All right. How far away are they? And I mean, are they stepped up patrols? And is it having any kind of an impact at all? Yes, it has. It had great. I mean, they hear um, all the time now. You can see them every day. Mm -hmm. uh, they patrol at night and days, and I and I really appreciate that. Yeah. So this, uh, uh, the shoot. Yep. I know you guys are getting ready to have a meeting there to address this. What's on the agenda? Yes, it's on six. It at six o'clock. Uh, the violence. Uh, what we can do uh, to stop it? Uh, what type of of uh, thing we're gonna do to uh, address the community? We're getting their input on it. Uh, maybe we may to get a um, police station here. Right. Uh, cameras. The cameras. We talked about that. So that's gonna be uh, my main topic tonight. Of uh, by getting the station and cameras here in Crawford. How did the decision to cancel the Christmas parade go over, Mayor? I'm curious. It's been a 20 year tradition there for you in Crawford, Mississippi, and I know you couldn't have it last year because of COVID. What's the town reaction been to canceling it? Well, but you know what? The, the, the Friday, Monday, uh, when the uh, no, Tuesday, when it happened, you know, this thing was going through my mind and, pe and the people who got the shooting. And on Friday, I said that um, we're gonna cancel this. We're gonna we're gonna gotta cancel it. So I did. I canceled it that Friday, right. and also when I canceled that Friday that night, uh, the young man got shot. Um, so I'm glad I did. And the community is behind me 100 percent by canceling the parade. Mm -hmm. And the community tonight, the meeting of uh, uh, the community meeting tonight, and uh, that's what I'm headed to now. Right. But uh, everybody behind behind me 100 percent. All right. Well, listen, Mayor, uh, we appreciate the time and we hope the best for you and your town there in Crawford, Mississippi. And uh, happy holidays to you and everyone there. And hopefully things calm down for you. Appreciate the time. Thanks.
Thank you so much. All right, take care. Another incident at an airport, this time a fight between a passenger who'd been delayed for 10 hours and a TSA agent, and it was all caught on video. How does this keep happening? Plus, California taking action to stop all those smash and grab robberies. $300 million worth. Will it be enough? Look on maximizing your income in retirement. Annuity do's and don'ts for baby boomers. From leading financial firm J.D. Melberg. That's right, free. This book reveals little-known truths about annuities in simple-to-understand terms. Grab a pen right now, because we're about to offer you this free book that unlocks the five little-known truths we believe baby boomers and seniors should know before buying an annuity, and it's free. Call 800-616-3998. As a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report. We researched numerous products and summarized rates and benefits of annuities, all from Silac Insurance Company. Call 800-616-3998, then 800-616-3998. Call now. California Governor Gavin Newsom has said, don't ever confuse me with the defund the police movement. He's apparently lived up to that statement because the one-time San Francisco mayor, a Democrat, is now calling for $300 million more to crack down on organized smash-and-grab thefts like this one in his state. Joining us now, retired LAPD sergeant, our friend Cheryl Dorsey. Sergeant, I would ask you what's going on and what's changed, but we can see it. Yeah, and listen, you know, um, <laughs> it's never a problem until it's a problem. And so while it sounds like a lot of money, it, it's not all going to the police. Some of that is going to be going to those affected businesses so that they can try to recoup the losses and maybe better fortify uh, their establishments in the process. That's a lot of money, $300 million. Imagine what that money could be used for, Sergeant. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, people have uh, brought this upon themselves. They, they started off with the defunding the police, and so now this is kind of like a a whiplash boomerang kind of thing where money's removed and uh, certain uh Departments within the Los Angeles Police Department, for sure, have shut down. Station hours uh, are no longer available 24-7. Specialized units that would be very proactive in these kinds of crimes cease to exist. And so now they've got to play catch up. Right. Did you see this brawl at the Miami airport, Sergeant? Um, I'm guessing you did, right? I mean, we asked you to put the chief's hat on a lot, but what would you do? Th this was a unique situation in a couple of ways, but I don't know how much it matters. I mean, these guys apparently had been delayed for hours and hours. Um, but what do you do if you're consulting airports and airlines, Sergeant? I mean, we've had five, th more than 5,000 incidents of unruly passengers in the air. And, and I guess typically before the pandemic, there might be 500. What's going on? Well, you know, everybody's on edge, and I get that. I have a, I have a couple of problems with this. I mean, both sides have some culpability. The officer, uh, at one point in the video, can be seen brandishing his weapon, pointing it at everybody, and he wasn't going to fire because of background. There were too many innocent bystanders. So I want to say to folks who want to uh, record police, do so in a safe manner. Bullets have no names, and if the officer had an accidental discharge, it would be a problem. With regards to people who misbehave in the airport, I think there should be a standardized, standardized no-fly list, and they should never be allowed to get on another plane with that mm -hmm. uh, airline or any other when they misbehave. I it's guess just unacceptable. What I don't understand, we talked about it today in our meeting, that, you know, there have always been delayed flights. People have always spent time with, you know, layovers at the airport bar. I just, I, I don't know what's happened to us. I really don't, Sergeant. This is nothing new. We know this to be true, but I think the consequence needs to be uh, different because if you don't do anything to deter the bad behavior, then you encourage it. When others see it and, and they're ill-tempered and short-tempered, then they misbehave knowing that nothing is going to be done. All right, let's talk about Chicago for a minute, Sergeant. On pace to lose more than 1,000 officers, according to our station here in Chicago, WGN to res resignation and retirement. Um, sure, this is not rocket science and not a surprise to you, but violent crime arrests are down, violent crime is up. All of which is inherent to police work. And if these police chiefs really wanted to do more to recruit uh, viable candidates, they certainly could. On the LAPD, I saw it firsthand uh, when I joined, the extent to which LAPD was willing to go, the, the various states in which they sought 
qualified candidates. There's certainly folks on universities who have an interest in law enforcement. And so there are viable candidates out there, but if they don't have an appetite to hire people, particularly who look like me, then they're going to continue to have these kinds of problems. If that's the case, why are departments down so much? I guess because I wonder, you know, not only sort of the, the relationship that you and I have talked about a lot between police and many communities, but also it's just, frankly, a really difficult job. And, and it's not a job a lot of people want based on what they face on a daily basis, which we're seeing play out in the courts right now. Well, you have to have ambassadors who will go out there and speak to what a great opportunity it is. I, I get that this is not the job for everyone, but what a great opportunity. I certainly uh, had some uh, tr troubling times during my 20 year career, but they far were outweighed by the great times, the great relationships and the good partners. And that's what the community needs to hear, particularly people who look like me because they hear FTP and I'm being uh, politically correct right now at home right. and they don't hear the other side. Uh, yes, uh, F the police, I guess we could probably, if, for those who didn't get it. Do you see things getting any better, Sergeant, um, or not right now? I mean, it, right now, do you think things are getting better? No, I don't, I don't see it getting any better, and I don't believe that many police chiefs have an appetite to really turn this uh, ship around. I've certainly tried to reach out to my police chief here, Chief Michael Moore in L.A., to help him with his recruitment efforts, and he gives me a lip service. <laughs> <laughs> I was born at night, but not last night, and so I know that what I'm hearing is disingenuous and intellectually dishonest, and so until they're ready to do something different, uh, they're going to have this problem. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine anyone giving you lip service, Sergeant. I just don't see it happening, but uh, we'll take your word for it. Listen, on that note, again, uh, you're another guest we have relied on a lot this year since we launched, and it's been great to have your voice, and I really appreciate you being part of it. I appreciate you as well, Joe. Be well. All right. Happy New Year. Peace. California's major population centers, L.A. and San Francisco Bay Area, losing residents at a rapid pace. According to data recently released, both metro areas lost population over the last year. That's the first time it's ever happened. This, as the most populous state in the nation, posted just its second year-over-year -year decline in history. So what exactly is causing this mass exodus from the Golden State? And is that actually the problem? Let's ask Carl DeMaio. He joins us now, chairman of the chairman of Reform California and also former San Diego City Councilman. And I, and I noticed, I, I pointed that out because San Diego County reported its first annual decline ever. What's going on out there, Carl? Well, it's, it's somewhat linked to the last conversation you had, and that is California's crime rate has skyrocketed, and so people don't feel safe here anymore, but also the cost of living has gotten to a point that it's unsustainable. We have the highest income tax, the highest gas tax, the highest car tax, the highest sales tax, the highest property tax in the country, along with regulations and mandates. That has priced a lot of working families out of our state. And finally, we do have uh, significant problems with quality of life. The schools are falling behind, uh, basic proficiency standards not being met. We have a skyrocketing homeless population, so the streets are filthy. Uh, the California uh, experience of being the golden state, it's been long tarnished, and that's why many Californians are, are weighing every day whether right. they should be leaving, and a lot of folks have already made the decision to leave. So based on our research, the state lost about 183,000 people in 2020 and 173,000 between July of last year and July of this year. You lost a congressional seat uh, for the first time in the state's history. But I guess the bigger problem, Carl, isn't necessarily the people leaving. It's the lack of people moving in, right? I mean, that they're saying that this isn't as much a, a Cal exodus as it is a, a decrease in Cal entrances. Well, it's both. Um, you do have a net migration from our state. People are leaving. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously there is illegal immigration. There are a certain number of people that are coming in. But from other states, we are not seeing people move to California. Uh, if you take a look at U-Haul, U-Haul, uh, will cost an arm and a leg to rent a, a basic van or a truck to move from California uh, to another state. But you can basically count on being paid by U-Haul to uh, rent a U-Haul to drive from another state to California so they huh. can get more U-Hauls back here. It's both a, a, a problem of people leaving the state and a problem of people not wanting to come to the state because they witnessed some of the problems that, that national news organizations are reporting. The high crime rate, the high cost of living, high cost of gas, 
uh, th these problems will scare away people from moving to California. Policies as well, which I know have been controversial in that state, but I guess the number of people moving to California from other states we found down 38% since the start of the pandemic in the Bay Area, especially hit harder on that. Uh, California used to be a destination, Carl. Everyone wanted to live there, and I'm sure you know where you spent a lot of time in San Diego. That, to me, is sort of like the weather mecca. How, how does California get back to being what it once was? Well, we're blessed by our natural beauty, our environment yeah. out here, our diverse economy, uh, but we're cursed by our government. Uh, we have one party control in California. The Democrats run the show in San Diego, Los Angeles, the Bay Area. It is completely run by Democrats at both the state and local levels. Very few parts of the state even have any sort of political balance. And so a lot of this has to do with self-inflicted wounds uh, imposed by politicians who really are, are enacting bad policies. Uh, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Uh, the reality is they're in charge. The Democrats are in charge. And these problems have festered under their watch. And so I think that part of the problem is that we have a sick California because California's political system is so dysfunctional. It's one party rule. There really is no balance uh, or checks in our political system. Last I checked, I think there hadn't been a Republican to win statewide in California since I think 2005, if I'm correct on that. Uh, and there have been some high profile departures as well, including Elon Musk. Um, lots of interesting things happening in California. Chairman of Reform California, Carl DeMaio, thanks for joining us and explaining some of it. Take care. Thanks so much. Have a happy holidays. You too. It's been nearly four months since our chaotic exit from Afghanistan, and there are still Americans who want out. Up next, we'll talk with someone who's trying to help some of them. And will we ever know how many are really left behind? New Year's Eve will mark four months since the last American troop left Afghanistan after a chaotic and deadly exit from America's longest war. Now, months after we left, the White House is admitting that dozens of Americans and Afghans are still left behind. Since August 31st, the State Department says it helped 479 Americans and 450 allies relocate to the U.S. But back in September, President Biden said there were only 100 to 200 Americans still there. According to the Wall Street Journal, by the end of November, the State Department was tracking 126 Americans still in Afghanistan with five ready to depart. I want to bring in now retired Army Lieutenant Colonel and Green Beret, our friend Scott Mann. He's been a great voice for us on all things military and especially Afghanistan. Colonel, it's good to see you again. What's the reality there on the ground? Are you still helping people get out? Yeah, hey, Joe, thanks for having me back on. And, and you know what? Thank you for keeping this issue alive uh, because the situation in Afghanistan is still extremely bleak. And yes, Pineapple and other groups are still helping keep uh, at-risk Afghans and American citizens and legal permanent residents alive. Uh, and there are absolutely Americans still behind enemy lines and green card holders who still want to get out that have not. Right. I know, understandably, you have been hesitant to share a lot of details, but can you give us an idea of some of the challenges you're still facing, especially now that we're gone? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, you know, our focus, we, we are helping, of course, any, any American citizen or green card holder that we encountered during the days of the fall of the airport, we're still helping them and communicating with the State Department. And frankly, I believe the State Department needs to step up their diplomatic efforts uh, with third countries like Qatar and others and bring pressure uh, to help get these American citizens and others out. I mean, it's ridiculous, for example, that in Qatar, a baby needs a passport. I mean, we can bring diplomatic pressure to bear. There was a time, Joe, when an American citizen, if an American citizen was held behind enemy lines, we would move heaven and earth to get them out. And it just seems to me that that's, it's a bit more casual right now. But the other thing I'm worried about is in Afghanistan is there is a real dire humanitarian crisis evolving right now that if we don't address it soon, it's going to have some serious international implications as well. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. And since you brought it up, let's get to it now, because I don't know that people have paid enough attention to this or know enough about it. But the U.N. has said that we're on the brink of a humanitarian crisis there when it comes to food shortages and the hunger situation. What are you hearing from your people on the ground? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, for example, right now, OperationRecovery.org, who have been doing amazing work keeping 6,000 at-risk Afghans alive in safe houses with food and water. This includes LBGTQ, female judges, Afghan commandos, some of the most at-risk people you know, in the inventory. We've been keeping them alive exclusively on private sector money, donations by viewers and other people that are helping us out. And right now we're clipping treetops, Joe. If we can't get more donations in, because we're getting no help from the government, if we can't get donations in, there's a very good chance that in the middle of winter, some of the most at-risk people in Afghanistan are going to be turned out back into the streets uh, you know, at the, at the, at the, at facing the Taliban. And I, I just think that's something that we can't endure as another moral injury in this country. How do we do it, Colonel? Because it's not like we can fly C-130s back in there, right, and land, and it's not like we can do all of this with commercial aircraft. It would take, I would think, years. No, we've made so many mistakes on this, and that time for accountability is coming, is coming due now, particularly as we face midterm elections and things like that. But here's what I will say. There are a whole bunch of veteran volunteers and American civilian volunteers who know where these at-risk people are. They know who they are, and we have their trust. We need to demand from Congress, from the State Department and the Biden administration that they work more closely with these volunteer groups to help push funds in there. It is bigger than the private sector can handle. It's bigger than these veterans can handle. They've been on a 100 plus day 911 call, Joe. And if we don't get some relief to these veterans, we're gonna start seeing that 22 a day go up as well because we're asking them to do something that they're not capable of doing for the long game. We need the government's help. Colonel, I know people are always riveted by your, your visits on our broadcast, and I wanted to give you a chance before we go to just let them know where they can go to find out more information about what you do and how they can help. Yeah, so I appreciate that. And right now, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to be a voice for these amazing veterans who are in the, in, in the shadows right now. They've, they've cashed in their savings accounts, their 401ks. I believe one of the best operations out there is OperationRecovery.org. Uh, I'm, they're doing a great gown, ground game. They're keeping 6,000 people alive. And if you wanted to make an end of year donation, it's a really great place to keep some wonder people, wonderful people alive until spring comes to the Hindu Kush and we figure out our next move. All right, Colonel, uh, again, on another personal note, you have been such a big part of our, our broadcast here since we launched and you've just made us all so much smarter, again, on all things military and especially Afghanistan. You walked us through that exit and it was great to have you every night and I wish you all the best in the new year and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot, Joe, and thank you for keeping this story alive in the hearts of the American people. We cannot forget our veterans, and we cannot forget our Afghan brothers and sisters. All right, you bet. Take care. We'll see you soon. In tonight's American Snapshot, how one Tennessee music professor figured out a way to see if his students were actually reading the syllabus. You don't want to miss this. And how much it cost him in the end. Back after this. City College of New York in Harlem got a special delivery this holiday season, a package addressed to the chairman of the physics department. What was inside? $180,000 cash. In addition, the package had a note inside directing the college to use the money on scholarships for math and physics department students. And get this, the unmarked had been, uh, package had been sitting in the mailroom for more than nine months. The return address didn't provide any answers, but the sender made it clear they were an alum. How about that? Here's tonight's American Snapshot, a journey back to your college years. Remember the syllabus they always hand out at the beginning of the semester? Did you ever actually read it? Well, a Tennessee professor was set to find out. Kenyon Wilson, a music professor from the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, buried a secret nugget in last semester's syllabus. The clue led to a locker with a $50 cash prize inside, the first student who claimed it. But did anyone notice the clue? Nope. All 70 students skimmed right over it. So thanks to the professor from the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, for providing tonight's American Snapshot. 50 bucks unclaimed. That's a lot of beer money. On Balance is next. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.